Welcome to the HPC Best Practices webinar series. Uh, the series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of the XA Scale Computing Project of the United States Department of Energy. The series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. I'm Ozzy Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley, and I'll be the host for today's webinar, Software Engineering Challenges and Best Practices for Multi-Institutional Scientific Software Development. And the webinar will be presented by Keith Beatty. Keith is a computer systems engineer at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, where he has been for the past 20 years. He has experience in bringing modern open source software engineering practices to academic and research contexts. His interests are in understanding and addressing the unique challenges in leading multi-institutional, geographically dispersed scientific and software development teams, particularly teams composed of members with a scientific, but not necessarily soft, software engineering backgrounds. Keith has worked in the industry as a software engineer and release manager, and apparently he likes to torture local music venue attendees playing bass and rock bands. That's great, Keith. So we have issued two, uh, more actually than 200 tickets for this webinar. Let's see how many people join us today. All attendees have been muted upon entry. We'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also a Google Doc. I'll paste the address to the doc uh, soon. And the webinar will have breaks so the speaker can respond to the questions that come in. Keith, please. So yeah, on. thank you. Thank you, Ozzy. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let's see, let me share the screen and get started. Um, okay, thank you so much. This is this should be interesting. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that we face and what I have found to be uh, some best practices in terms of um, helping uh, a software development effort for uh, scientific projects, um, usually multi-institutional with uh, various disciplines. Um, and Keith, also I have Dan, Dan Gunter's name here. He's helped with a lot of this content. Um, I think he's on the call here somewhere, but um, I'll be doing most of the speaking. Um, so, um, okay, so a little bit of background. You heard some of it already, but I've been at LBL for about 20 years. I have a bachelor's in math and master's in computer science. I don't have a PhD. Um, I did actually work in industry for about five years. Um, I finished my master's at LBL, and then I went went, went worked in industry for about five years, and it was it was a really good experience, interesting experience back in the 99, 2000, 2000 early 2000s time. Um, at LBL, I've had um, a, I've worked on several different projects, um, uh, all the way back Ice Cube in the early days of the construction of the project. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details there, but if you ever want to hear about what it's like to go to the South Pole. I will talk your ear off. It was a lot of fun. Um, I was basically part of the data acquisition team there. I helped them with the development of the DAC for the IceQ project. Uh, since then, I've worked on several other projects for CCSI, also now called CCSA2. It's a carbon capture simulation initiative. Um, that was about um, doing software models for developing different carbon capture technologies at all the different scales. Um, Spot it was a really interesting project. It was a super facility kind of marrying the light sources with computational uh, compute centers. Um, I think that was where the first super facility term was actually used with that project. Um, IDEAS is another project that I've been working a lot on. Um, and that um, has then spawned a bunch of other projects that have kind of, that are kind of building off, to, off, off of that. I'm going to talk a little more detail about that. And then most recently, I've also started working on the Lux Zeppelin project, which is something similar to IceCube in that it's a it's a dark matter detector. Um, so, um, okay, that's kind of my background to give you the context of, um, of where I'm coming from. So the big question here is how can we develop scientific software that best serves our science mission? Um, I'm gonna try to answer that question. I don't claim to have the right answer, um, but I, I am gonna try to go through some of the challenges that we faced, come up with and show you an approach that seems to be working pretty well. Um, so I wanna, let's, let's look at it. I wanna start by trying to compare software development in the industry versus the way software development is done in a science context. Um, it's important to realize that this comparison is really tempting 
which is why I'm going to do it. But it's also important to understand that it's very misleading. Um, but I think it can be helpful. So on the industry side, let's look at the different roles that exist in industry software development. There's sales, and those are the people who are in charge of the revenue. They go out, they sell the software, find customers, interact with them. Marketing, these are the people who do competitive analysis. They will do communication and branding. They generate leads for the sales team. There's a product manager who usually has, they're in charge of the roadmap and oftentimes in charge of customer support. This organization can be very different between different companies. This is just one kind of common way of structuring the in industries will structure their, um, the whole sales, uh, the, the whole software development effort from top to bottom. There's engineering. That's the one we're probably the most familiar with. They do the implementation, they do research. Um, there's quality. So these are the people who, the, 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 the testers, the QA, they do the verification, they check for stability and reliability. Um, they could also do usability. That could, that could fall under any, a lot of the other categories as well. Operations, these are the people who are in charge of the hardware. DevOps, often called. Um, that's a big, big section as well. Let's try to compare this to some of the science roles. There's the funding agency. There's the, the people who, who um, are in charge of the scientific mission. They're the ones that you apply for and you get money from. They're the ones that are funding the whole project. There's usually a principal investigator. That's the person who's going to be in charge of the scientific results. And then there is a collection of scientists, engineers, postdocs, and students. And what's interesting here is that those, those people participate in the development of the software, but they're often interchangeable based on skills and experience. There isn't this kind of more structured or strict division of labor or, or specialization that happens in industry. Now, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think making that observation can be informative about how, um, uh, what we can learn from industry in, in terms of doing this. Um, so another observation is that who is facing what challenges can change over time. For example, <clears throat> for example, about 10, 20 years ago, science was the only people who were talking about big data, right? Um, since then, companies like Google, and Amazon, does it, I mean, they're now, they're worrying about a lot of data. Whereas it seemed like 20 years ago when I was starting, um, nobody was worrying about, it. most industries weren't worried about terabytes or petabytes of data. Um, it's also changing that reusable software was usually only worried about industry and, uh, or industry was only worried about that. That's changing now. So, uh, science context, we're, we're starting to become more concerned about reusable software. So these are open questions. It's what can be learned by comparing the two? Um, even the differences between universities and national labs can be, can be pretty dramatic. So I'll give, start with an example of what, of a project that I'm working on um, where I have come up with uh, a kind of a back pra best practice in terms of doing so or leading a software development effort. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use IDEAS as an example. That's the Institute for the Design, design of um, Energy Systems. Little note here, I couldn't possibly resist the temptation to talk about a project called IDEAS in an IDEAS uh, sponsored uh, uh, webinar. Uh, we're very well aware of the misspelling uh, of our name. Uh, so what is it? It's a software framework for modeling chemical processes. Uh, the original focus was on power plants. It was funded by the Department of Energy, um, the fossil energy, um, but it's kind of, it's expanded to, um, for all of process system engineering. So, um, and it's a project that has uh, contributors and participants across, uh, across the country. Berkeley, where I'm sitting at, um, and then there's Sambia, we have uh, uh, University of Notre Dame, um, NETL and CMU and uh, West Virginia University. I think West Virginia, anyway, there. Um, so we've got about 40 contributors, mostly part-time, um, 30 of which are chemical or process, engineer, process engineers. Uh, about five or so are people who have actual computer science or software engineering background. And we've got about five that are uh, chemists and material scientists. This is now being used by several other projects. There's NAWI, which is kind of a, a, another project that's starting um, more concerned with um, uh, reverse osmosis and desalinization. Um, dispatches, is, we're looking at power grid, modeling power grid, and some of the, a lot of the big issues that are faced there. And then Pareto is another one, a uh, new one where they're looking at 
uh, issues around produced water and how that can be better managed. So that's an example. And I, what I want to try to do is show you what I see as being some of the con interesting context for scientific software development and some of the challenges. And I've got to, I'm going to break these up into like six different scales. Um, the first one is how many different contributors you have in your project. Um, at the, you could have a very small project where there's just one developer, or you could have another project where there's many, many developers, and I've worked on both of them. Put the little mark here, I dance the dot in the middle. 40 or so developers, if you count everybody who's involved with it, with the development of it. Um, how many different time zones? Um, the the, uh, the contributors are distri distributed across. Could be just one time zone. This one has multiple time zones across the, the, the country. This one here is what I refer to as what is the contributor's software development exposure. Now, on the far left, you could have a solo scientist where it's just where um, it's just an individual who has only developed software for themselves, right? Or on the other scale, you can have it across a wide project, a very large project. I like to use an analogy that I came up with that developing software is a lot like cooking, in that any of us can, you know. Uh, cook well enough to keep ourselves alive. I can make scrambled eggs and grilled cheese sandwiches, uh, that sort of thing. But that's that's a different thing from throwing a dinner party, where if you have a bunch of friends over and you may have a couple of courses, um, that's going to involve a lot more skill and understanding, planning, preparation. That then is a completely different thing from opening a restaurant, right? So I see these as somewhat analogous. The solo scientist is somebody who's written some software for themselves. A lot of people who finish graduate degrees or go through college have this kind of experience where they've written software. Software is not their main focus. They could have a chemistry or a physics background, but they've learned enough in order to collect some data, analyze some data, produce some results, and finish their, you know, get their dissertation you know, signed off, right? Um, that's different from if you write software that your local team uses, right? And that again is then different from if you write software that someone you will never meet can download your software run it, find some utility in it. That would be like someone coming to your restaurant. So um, I think that's a really important distinction to, uh, to make. Another is how many installations of the software that you're producing are there going to be? Um, at one scale, um, if you just have a production website, you're, you're doing a website, then that's in a sense only one installation. Uh, the data acquisition system for a large uh, detector, that's only one installation, right? Or you could have you know, a piece of shrink wrap software that you know, people would well, shrink wrap. Or that's an old phrase now. A software that uh, anybody could use. So you could have the entire world. You have scales in there. Um, you could have software that only your only team members of yours are gonna be using um, within the same project that you're on. Or there could be people within the community. Ideas originally started out as people really only within the process of an engineering community. But now that we have projects that depend on Ideas, it's now multiple communities that could be using the, that software. That's something you need to think about when you're doing your software development. Here's another real big challenge. How, what is your contributor time allocation? What percentage of each person's time can they contribute to the development of that software? In a science context, it's pretty rare that somebody could be 100% on a project. Um, most of the time, it's 50 or 10 or sometimes people are given 0% allocation. You know, it's usually like a management type of role. Um, that's, that's another real challenge that happens. The other scale that I think about is how many different institutions there are involved in it. It's a single institution. That's a very different thing from a multi-institutional collaboration. This last one becomes really important because um, there may not necessarily be a single authority over it, over making a you know dictating this is the way that we're going to do there's in the industry there usually is there's going to be a cto or director of engineering and that person can say this is this is the language that we're going to use this is the technology that we're going to use and um, a lot of times when you have multiple institutions you don't have that strong authority so you have to approach the management of your software development in a different way a lot of people scrum is a really popular methodology software development methodology um, we had at um, LBL, we had somebody come in and give us a presentation. This was several years ago now, where um, this person went through and gave us a presentation about Scrum, talked about Scrum Master, Sprints, Daily Standups. 
uh, stakeholders, uh, backlog grooming, all the good stuff about Scrum. Um, I was about to ask this question. Somebody else beat me to it, though. And they asked the uh, person talking about Scrum, how can we, in a research scientific environment, where we have collaborators spread across multiple time zones, unrelated projects, and they're, and they're split across time, so they can, you get 10, maybe 20% of somebody's time on a project, how can we best apply the Scrum methodology? Um, it was interesting. He took a long pause, and then his answer was to find another job, which I thought was really interesting. Um, it's not, I'm not trying to dump on this guy. He actually gave a really good presentation. He didn't follow it up by saying it, but you know, there's some things about Scrum that may apply to your context and others that may not. You may have to modify it to some extent. Um, but it, point, I, it, it, was, it was, I think it was a very revealing uh, comment, an honest one um, about what, how, what will work and what won't work in that context. So taking a step back, Scrum is really a subset of Agile. And Agile is really a philosophy, whereas Scrum and Kanban are methodologies that then try to apply that philosophy. And Agile is, it, Agile is, a, is a very simply stated philosophy. It, it, it basically says, it's a list of, we value, we value X over Y. Although Y is still important, we feel that X is more important. These are things like individuals and interactions, over process and tools, so working software over documentation, collaboration over you know, some contract negotiation, and responding to teams as opposed to, you know, following a fixed plan. That literally is, that's the whole manifesto. <laughs> you go, go to this, it's very simply stated, but it has some pretty broad implications. Um, actually, Mike Perot, um gave a webinar in this series uh, last year. So we encourage you to go check that out. The reality though, is that Scrum makes some, for us, let's say assumptions. Those being that everybody's in a common location, everybody has full-time participation, there's a single authority, can um, kind of direct and adjudicate differences. So the question is what parts of Agile or even Scrum do still apply? Basically all of the Agile manifesto in my opinion. It all still applies. It's just what particular implementation of it, what methodology you're gonna use. So a lean towards Kanban, which is basically more of a flexible, more of a visual. I think it comes from the idea of a card carrying approach where there's little cards I think originally come from the Japanese, uh, how they would have cards that would go along with each piece through, um, I, I think it was like a, you know, like a, a, a machine uh, line of work and that the different cards would talk about the different states. So it's, so it's more of a visual approach. And it's more of, a, more of an approach that emphasizes continuous delivery, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, it's still not a perfect fit, but I think it's a much better one for our context. So I'm working what I would call a modified Kanban approach of that job. Um, so we'll go into it. What are some of the practices that I found have worked out really well? Scheduled meetings, scheduled releases, iterative incremental improvements over time. Iteration is always very important. And that what the idea behind that is, is that you want the process, you want to do iterative incremental improvements, not only to the, to the process itself, as well as some of the practices that are involved in this process. I'm gonna go into these in more detail. Education is very important. You wanna educate all the developers that are in your project, not only on the process, but also on, on the tools and the process. And you want that education to be internal and also external because it's important for you to then educate the people further up the stack in your, uh, in your project, like, like uh, uh, the different project managers in, in there. So how do we break this down? Identify some roles. The facilitator role is a person who basically is driving and managing that process. They're the one who, the, that's the person who runs the scheduled meetings. Um, and that they can they drive that, they drive that process. Um, that person, like myself, is the, that's the role that I usually have on a lot of the projects that I'm on. They don't necessarily need to have domain experience. I, I work with chemical engineers and physicists. I don't have a chemical engineering or, or uh, physics background. This, I think, actually is beneficial in that it prevents me from getting into the weeds of the physics or the chemistry um, so that I can, I, I mean, we would still need those people, of course, to do that, but it, it allows me to kind of stay in that facilitator role. Um, you have a, a collection of developers. You have senior, of course, you need senior developers who actually do have the, the domain expertise and have some experience with software development, facilitator, 
works at training these people, right? Um, you want junior developers and you want users and you want stakeholders um, um, to be involved in this because they can then give you input as to how the software development is working. You want new, fresh set of eyes coming in and taking a look at the work that you're doing um, to look at the software, to read through the documentation that you produced and make sure that that software is working well. Um, so we'll go into a little more details here. So what we do is we have weekly telecons or with the technical team. Um, that is somewhat analogous to the daily standups that Scrum talks about, but, it, but daily standups are kind of impractical, but weekly or every other weekly calls are usually possible. It could be monthly depending on the pace of the, of the project and how much. I try to encourage, um, I do screen sharing. I try to encourage people to have the video on because it kind of builds recognition and it builds you know, team communication and cohesion. I think it's a really important part of all this is building the culture around the development and the cult and the relationships that the people have within the projects that you're working. Um, another big big part of this is I'm a strong believer in date driven over feature driven releases. Now this is a really subtle, but it's a really powerful technique because it allows everybody to it, it allows you to say, hey, you miss this bus? No big deal. There's gonna be another one coming along soon. And that is that ends up being a really subtle but a powerful way of getting people to make dates because you know, it's no big deal. If you miss this, there'll be another one, right? So this this feeds into the fact that there often usually is not a strong authority because you've got you spread across different institutions. So I'm not anybody's boss, so I can't you know force somebody to do something, right? So you have to. So I think there's several reasons for doing this. Uh, if you're feature driven, then you can you tend to be tempted into letting a release date slip because you're waiting for some feature or some fix to happen. Whereas if you just say, it just ha happens on a cycle, it's, it, it can be very effective. Combo boards. So these are these ideas. Um, th th this is, you basically have these boards with these little stickers, stickies that you can move from one column to the next. Um, there's a lot of really good tools for this. GitHub has some really good ones. GitLab has some really good ones. There's other products that do this kind of uh, project boards. So basically, I break it up into two sections. I have a priority board, and that's where all the issues and the PRs go. Um, and that's where they're prioritized as to how you prioritize it for the team, but you give them a priority. And then there's a release board, and that's for each of the scheduled releases. So all the issues um, and the PRs go on those release boards. And what you do is you go through the release board, you first prioritize everything, then you go through the release board and say, what's for this release? And then during these, weekly telecons, we go through all of those projects and talk to the people, allow conversations to happen between the developers. Um, so what happens is that these weekly calls become like an open forum for technical discussion, where you can let the people jump into the weeds, the people, you know, about the specific issue or the PR that's being discussed. Um, it's a place for test, it's a place where testing results can be discussed. It's a place where training can happen. So more junior junior people can come on and they can see how these discussions are happening. It's a place where even some reviews, you can, I mean, maybe not a full review, but you can start or you can discuss some of the reviews of the of the pull requests and the merge requests that are coming in and the code that's being changed. The whole idea is to establish a supportive and kind of a productive culture around the software development. Um, okay, we'll go into a little bit more detail. So issues, um, here's, more of the process tools and building up team culture. So there's issues, there's pull requests, get line calls and merge requests, same difference. Um, and also that's where code reviews can happen, which is a really important thing because it allows people to see what's happening um, with the code. If there's an education process, even if you're the one who's having your code reviewed, it's also good to pay attention to us if it's not your code to see how, the, how that, you can learn a lot by seeing someone else's code get reviewed. Um, so we prioritize and target all of those onto a release board. Issues, in they can be bugs, they can be features, they can also be discussions. You can have discussions with issues. That's, that Issues are very powerful. Um, pull requests, merge requests, that's an opportunity for code reviews. You should identify who are the reviewers for all the code. If there's a if the code is addressing a, a particular subset of the, of the code, there may be owners of that or people who are, you can divide it up in lots of different ways as to what kind of review they're doing. Um, code standards, uh, there could be specific you know, physics 
uh, requirements that you want to make sure are being reviewed. It could be reviewed for the physics, it could be reviewed for uh, the coding style, it could be reviewed for testing, it could be reviewed for documentation. These are all important aspects of reviews to go through. Um, you want to have some kind of continuous integration, meaning an automated set of tests uh, that happen. And I mean test in the broadest sense here. They could be testing for how much coverage, how much the code is actually exercised. You may want to have automated tests for like coding standards or style guides, um, if so that the code is you know laid out in the way that, it, that that the team has agreed is the way that we're going to structure our code. How many spaces or tabs? You put single quotes or double quotes around strings if your language doesn't care. Um, static analysis is another important thing. There's a lot of tools for this um, and documentation. All of that could be done automatically, right? Um, um, so the whole idea behind this is that during these code reviews, you want to make sure that it, it, it's an education process, but you also want to be supportive. You don't want to make somebody feel as though they're on the hot seat or that a code review is some sort of like punishment, right? So the idea is you're trying to build a, build a culture of, in your team around the software development. Developer onboarding is another really important thing as to how somebody who comes onto the project, how they're brought onto the project. Um, some examples are, you know, making sure that they know how to set up their own development environment. For some of these tools, that can be very, very complicated. Um, you want to make sure that they can, that a new developer can run their tests and generate the docs locally, uh, for example, um, as well as having it done within the, the CI system. Um, you want to make sure a developer knows how to set up a user environment, if that's a different context, right? Because those things could be, those things could be dramatically different if you support multiple OSs or multiple variations in environment that the software might run. You want to make sure that that user, that developer can reproduce any user issues that may come up, bugs that come up, and as well as test the features. There's a different ways of the environment. Um, another thing is about copyright license and intellectual property issues. In Ideas, we had a real challenge because some of the people were working with um, were working with uh, industry partners under NDAs. So they were working with data that these industry par partners considered, uh, you know, uh, proprietary in information. And we could not let that leak out into our open source repository. That would be catastrophic for the project. For it. So we, we, exactly how to protect both your partners with their intellectual property, as well as protect your own intellectual property. That's an important thing to try to figure out how to do. And that, and that you want to, to, you want to train your developers on how to do that. Um, you, um, I could go into more details about that, but we basically tried one approach, realized it wasn't working. We didn't have any leads, but we just realized it wasn't a perfect approach. And so we basically revamped our approach and basically incorporated that into our developer onboarding process. That the individual developer, if you're working under an NDA, you need to be responsible. You need to communicate with other people about how that that data is going to be protected. Offboarding is another um, important thing to think about. When someone leaves a project, what needs to be done? If there's any handing off permissions that need to be changed, ownership that hands off. Um, okay, let's go into some more, a little more details about the tools that we use. So I definitely have the philosophy that the specific tool that you use is less important than you actually use one. Um, GitHub, GitLab, it doesn't admit, it, it, it doesn't matter. Heck, you'd still be using Subversion or CVS. Um, th th these things are, it's, what's important is that you have a set of tools, you use them, the team understands them, uh, right? So version control issues, code reviews, I've said that a couple of times already. That, so these days, everybody seems to be used to Git, either as GitHub or GitLab. It's a great tool. I think it's wonderful. Has some sharp corners. It can be a lot to learn. So you want to make sure that when people are learning these things, you give them you know, just what they need um, and allow, uh, training is important, basically. So continuous integration, that's another really important thing. I touched on that earlier. You want to make sure that you have some mechanism where tests and code analysis is automatically run. These could, be, the tests, I'll go into these more, a little bit more detail, but testing is really important. You want to have different levels of testing. You want to have basic unit testing in place. It could be other integration testing where you're testing the components that come together. Um, you want to have style guides, static analysis. That can be really important. You want those to happen with each pull request or merge request as it gets opened in an automated way 
and you can even have it so it happens with each new commit that happens on a PR it's as, as, as a review happens and, and people say, okay, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna take in the, the review recommendations and make a change to the PR. Um, there's lots of different tools that allow you to do this. Jenkins is a good one, although that seems to be becoming less popular mostly because GitHub Actions and GitLab is giving you a lot of these tools to get a lot of this done in, in very powerful ways. Um, it gets complicated though. Um, you want to make sure that that continuous integration can be run locally in a developer environment so that a developer can understand that they can that they can run their unit tests or integration tests or these sorts of things before they open a PR um, and not just be lazy as sometimes all of us are and just open the PR, let your CI run and then find out what's happening. Um, uh, so continuous deployment, which is can be a subtle distinction between continuous integration and continuous deployment. I think of it more like you may have runs in your CI that take a long time. You may have tests that could take you know hours to run depending on the software that you that you're working with. You don't have to run those with each PR. That would be ridiculous. But you could set up nightly or weekly builds or weekly runs that could take extended periods of time. Um, those could test things like what a user installation process was like, because some issues may not come up until a user uh, uh, actually tries to do the insta installation. So you may wanna try to like uh, automate that in order to become aware as soon as possible, nightly or weekly, about any issues that may come up with that. Testing is a huge, huge topic that I think a lot of times we don't really, uh, certainly in science and research, we don't always think about. I think it's a good approach to have a test plan, which is basically your over, your governing document about how you are going to go about testing your software. Um, um, you can break that up a lot of times into different levels. You, you can have like smoke tests or there's system integration tests. You could have you know what your full acceptance test would be in order to say, yes, this release is ready and it's ready to go out to the public or the rest of your team or whoever you're um, producing to. Um, Coverage metrics is an important thing, but they are imperfect. Uh, you can have tests, you could have 100% of your code that's exercised by your tests, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all the code is perfect because um, the physicists like to use the, the word phase space. There's different, just because you execute a line of code doesn't mean that you've executed that line of code in every context that it could be executed. Um, that may not be practical. The, your phase space could be way too large for you to actually exercise, but you want to try to, you want, it, it's a, uh, I guess you would say it's a, it's a necessary, but not as sufficient <laughs> uh, to try to get your coverage metrics up as, as high as you can. There's lots of tools that will help you with this. There's linters that will look for, you know, those either style problems or, um, per, you know, per errors in your code that you may not, you may not recognize until runtime, um, or at least doing a static analysis. Black is a really interesting tool in that it does basically formatting of your code. This is for Python. It's formatting your code. It takes the philosophy that, you know, like, a, what was it, uh, the Henry Ford card, you can have any color you want, just as long as it's black. It basically says, this is how the code's gonna be formatted and takes away all of your options to say like, well, I want two spaces or four spaces, um, you know, instead of tabs or whatever. Um, Coverity, co coverage, these are other, um, static analysis um, like tools that can be really he helpful. They can give you a lot of good feedback. There's different testing approaches that you may want to adopt. You may want to do testing to see how your code fails because that can be important. If it gets bad input or if it, you know, it gets, you know, this line should never be executed. You know, you see those kind of things. Well, what happens if it does actually get executed for whatever reason that you didn't anticipate? How will your code fail? Um, you want to look at um, you may not be able to exercise the whole phase space, so maybe you'll start generating random input to give to input into your code. It's important to save this save the seed of your random number generator. I did that before where I had random input, found a bug, didn't keep the seed, was never able to reproduce that bug again. Um, uh, you want to do performance testing of your software. That's important. You want to do security testing. These are all different perspectives of how you can approach testing. Regression, backwards compatibility. There's a, it's it's a wide field that I think is important to at least you know jump into as much as you possibly can. Documentation is also a really important thing to have that automatically generated as part of your um, your set of tools as part of your 
um, CI. There's a lot of tools out there to help you do that. Read the docs are the great ones. Sphinx is a really um, powerful um, documentation. Um, Java docs, I always thought was a great addition. Doxygen for, um, that's more on the C, C++ side. Um, you want to have that documentation generated with each PR and you also want the developers to be able to locally generate that documentation because hopefully they will be writing the documentation as part of their PRs when they fix a bug or add a new feature. We experimented with, with this idea of executable documentation. A lot of time your documentation will have code in it, right? So you wanna make sure that that code still works, right? When you, if you change, you don't want your documentation to drift away from the code as one changes. So having something within your CI that will go through your documentation, pluck out the example code and execute it so that you can see that it still passes, but it, it still works, it still does what you claim it to do. Jupyter Notebooks is something that we use a lot in Ideas, um, we have a lot of tutorials and examples in that. And as part of our release process and our build process, we will run, we will run all those Jupyter Notebooks as if you just sat there and did like shift enter through all of them. Um, that, so that way we can verify when the code changes that our tutorials and our examples are still working. Um, Diataxis, I wanna just throw this out there. There's someone who's gone through and created what they're kind of sneakily uh, re referring to as a grand unified theory of documentation. Um, and they basically break it up into four quadrants, which I think is a really good framework for writing documentation. There's tutorials, there's how-tos, there's a background concepts, and then there's a reference. And um, this is another example, kind of like Black, where it's like, I'm just happy that somebody has put the time in and said, this is how we should structure it. I may not agree with all the specifics, but the fact that somebody has come up with a framework, I, I'll buy it, I'll, I'll buy it, I'll go there. And so we started to try to restructure our documentation. And so I think that's a good, that's a good way to, to structure your docu documentation. Um, okay, iteration, I think is a really, that's a theme across all of this is that it's, it's an educational, it's forgiving because you're just gonna do it again soon. And, and combine those two things together, it can be very forceful. So I would say that iteration is something that you should think about at all the different scales of your software development process in that you wanna iterate on the releases. So you have scheduled releases, you wanna iterate on the process itself. It, like, is this process working for the team? What else, what, what in this process needs to be changed? Maybe we should have every other weekly meetings. Uh, maybe we should have a structure our release boards differently. Um, you get that feedback from everywhere that you possibly can. Um, I'll give you an example. So for in testing, you want to start out, you have a new project that doesn't have any tests, start small, you start as early as you can with simple examples and then build up them incrementally. Like you start with like, let's just get 10% coverage and then maybe we can get 15, slowly build it up. And, and then, and from that, get experience about what works and what doesn't work. Um, you want to evangelize this whole process not only internally to the technical team, but you also want to bring it up to the project management so that they can see that you've got a process and that it's working and then get feedback about improving the process itself. So um, then the final level of iteration, I would say, is hopefully with these processes in place, we can improve the perception of scientific software um, within, the larger, within both your community and within the larger scientific context. So by doing that, I try to engage with professional organizations. That's what I'm doing right now with this, you know, talking. You want to talk, you want to try to bring this up to the fun, your funding sources for this, so that they can see that these processes are important and they're impactful to the project. Um, so um, I'm going to leave, I'm going to hit you with some pearls of wisdom. The first one is my software is like cooking analogy, which I always try, like to try to bring out. Hopefully people think it's good. I'd love to hear feedback. Um, there's a couple of other points here is that not all technical problems have technical solutions. I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Person-person um, -person communication, coordination, compromise is sometimes required if you have like a technical dispute, right? Um, similarly, not all social problems have social solutions, right? Tools can actually help with this. Um, pull request reviews, I think it's, it's a good structure where you can give people feedback in a supportive educational way. Um, linters and coding standards, it, it's like, okay, we were, the, the tool says that there's a problem here, 
right? It's not like somebody points it out to you, right? So I think these are important things to think, think about. This is, a, this is an expression that I only heard recently, um, but it is so true that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So if you don't, I've talked a lot about, about, a lot about the importance of building a culture in your project, a, a, a community, team cohesion, because um, if you've got people who aren't working together well and that there's pushing and pulling, like then it's not, yeah, <laughs> the best tools are not gonna help. Um, so you wanna work at establishing positive, constructive culture around your, your software development efforts. Okay, so here I'm gonna try to change this a little bit. So um, I wanna go back to the comment of the guy who taught us about Scrum, where he said to find another job. So our response to this, my response to this was to develop a software development process that would accommodate some of the realities of our, you know, the different six scales, six the different scales that I came up with. So what if rather than modify the process, the software development methodology to fit the environment, is there some way that we can modify the environment that we work with in to fit the process? So there is progress on this. Like, is there a way that we could make it so that people aren't split across, you know, five, 10 different projects so that they can focus more closely? Um, is there other ways? I, I, I don't know the answer to this, but there is some progress happening to this. And I think this, it's really important for us to recognize there is this emerging role of RSE, which is a research software engineer. And this actually started in the UK with people basically identifying that there are a whole collection of people who aren't, who have a science background, have an interest in science, but they aren't necessarily doing that science. What they're doing is they're writing software in support of that science. And, they, and I think they went through and said, there's like, I don't know, like a hundred different job titles um, but they are all basically fall into this category of what they're now identifying as a research software engineer. So I think it's important that we can identify that as an identified career path for people. Um, whether you come from a, a more science background or an engineering background, this is important because the reality is a lot of people do exactly that. They do find their own job. We have people come, I mean, we're in Berkeley, so we're really close to like the Silicon Valley. We lose people all the time to the big companies across the bridge and down the peninsula. Um, but we can compete with industry on a lot of different ways. I mean, I came back because I find working in science projects more interesting, right? Um, we can compete. With, so there's an opportunity for us to recruit and retrain um, even underrepresented groups, um, uh, people who may not be male, may not be white, or right? So we can, I think there's an opportunity for us if we can emphasize that. Um, there's a lot of different organizations that have come up around this. There's the United States Re uh, uh, Research Software Engineer Society. This is the original one in the UK. Better Scientific Software is another one. Um, so to this effort, we have to think about how we can start funding. I think this, this, what is a requirement for this is that we have real funding of so sustainable software, software stewardship, right? There's a report but as part of ECP, which is a really, really good report. That talks about how to transition Oscar after ECP. Um, hopefully, we can do this for things beyond HPC within Oscar. Um, sustainable software is a big topic. Um, we need to think about sustainability. There's many dimensions, and that, that there's this um, Carl's Corona uh, manifesto that talks about the different dimensions of sustainability, because that word can mean a lot of different things to different people. So it's important to think about how that fits in. Um, what kind of funding models can we have for sustainable software um, and software stewardship? We have hard money, we have soft money, we have a mix. Uh, these are open questions, but I think there is going to there can be a real return on investment if we um, emphasize the role of the RSE and basically raise um, uh, the level of attention um, of making software a first class citizen in the scientific mission. Um, because we'll minimize the churn of both the software, because a lot of times software has to get rewritten. There's another project, the one project ends, the funding for it disappears, or the project starts up. It, it, it'll, you know, software churn, we have to rewrite some software. That happens a lot. It shouldn't happen. We should be able to find software that could be commonly used across projects. Same goes with people. Okay, so here's some summaries. I've talked about the different challenges in our environment. 
uh, distributed multidisciplinary time slice developers um, used ideas as an example. Um, neither industry or Scrum are the answers, both have a lot to teach us. I try, for my proposed approach of facilitator led meetings, schedule releases, continuous iterative improvement, telling everybody about it. Um, the technical challenges, social challenges are still going to remain. Project culture is a foundation for all of this to work in. And, um, addressing some of our science and research challenges in addition to accommodating them. So trying to look at it from the other way around. What can we change about our environment as opposed to change the methodology? Um, a lot of this, let's make software development a first-class citizen of science. So this is my call to action at the end here for all of you, right? So what can we do, right? Um, in terms of scientific uh, software stewardship and scientific software careers, for all of us, for people who maybe aren't going to get that tenure track position or aren't going to get that, you know, senior scientist uh, position, right? They can they can still contribute very meaningfully to science. Um, I have a coworker coworker who identifies himself as a uh, reformed physicist, um, but he's very 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 smart and does tremendous contributions to these projects as what would otherwise be referred to as a software engineer. Um, okay. So here's a bunch of references. Um, uh, there's, there's Mike's um, webinar. I, I encourage you to take a look at that. The, uh, uh, the transitioning Oscar after ECP uh, that has a lot of really good ideas as a manifesto. Here's some more links to different RSD focused organizations, uh, some conferences and workshops. So um, I think that's about it. Um, let's see, I had one more with my acknowledgments. So I have to acknowledge the funding that I have and. A, a disclaimer. So, um, questions, please. Um, Thank arguments. you, Keith. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. Yes, we have a bunch of questions here. Just you know, okay. if you don't have time to finish them all, we'll ask you to, uh, and, uh, to you know, to write them, and then we'll send it the link to the okay. participants. Okay. But let, let's yeah. start with a short one here. Thank mm -hmm. you again, Keith. So, what are the challenges you faced relative to the data when you were working on Ice Cube? How did you solve them? <laughs> um so i i'm not sure if i'm the best person to ask that question because i was working on you know the data acquisition you collect the data and you send it off to somebody else right um we i i'm not like what's more specific challenges that's really general questions like um it's can i get can i can i get it more specific i mean we had I mean, Ice Cube had a lot of challenges with data. There was data, I mean, they would write it out to tape at, on, um, at the South Pole. And then there was a smaller subset of data that was moved up over the satellite because the only, the only collection we had was a satellite connection. So there was a lot of, um, that happened after the DAC. There was a processing and filtering stage, right? Um, but um, I don't know if that really answers the question. Maybe, I don't. If you, well, if you can ask them. yeah if the participant can be a little more specific we can get back to this later so let, yeah, let's yeah. Uh, now a longer question here keith at mm -hmm. the start of projects some non-profit research institutes and universities hire contractors to architect separate modules for asynchronous development for organizations that lack large project expertise how common are non-traditional contractors for example postdoc staff scientists uh, PIs participate in initial setup of multi-institutional scientific software papers, uh, projects rather, or uh, continuation of the question, or maybe there are volunteer scientific working groups that review software architecture and governance proposals and help with mentoring. Did you capture okay, so the, last, yeah, the last part of the question? Um, how, um, I think that sort of thing is very common that has where we have, and, and that it becomes very challenging as to how you're then going to integrate all those all those pieces in together. Um, my personal experience is I'm usually brought up, I, I have often been brought on at the beginning of the project. That's the best time to be brought on. So you can kind of look at the different components that are being developed and see how they're going to be integrated together. Um, but that can be a real challenge. Um, uh, I, I would say all of these practices, a lot of these practices are really important in terms of like documentation, because when you bring in contractors or you bring in postdocs, people who are basically only going to be there temporarily, um, there's a real risk 
that when that that when they leave or when the, when their contract ends or when they move on, like all of their um, you know the institutional or travel or knowledge disappears with them. So you want to make sure that they've done the documentation that somebody can look at, somebody could pick up, or even that they've written tests. You know, tests are a form of documentation, really. Um, yeah, since this was a long I, question, I, I think you, you, could, not, you could get back to it later and, and write, right? Yeah, 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 I'll try, yeah. Yeah, um, so an, an interesting one here, Keith. Uh, what types of funding sources or funding institutions are favorable to renewing grants for large multi-institutional projects, especially for software maintenance and community support? Uh, some institutions like the National Science Foundation seem resistant to renewals and seem to prefer finite project driven proposals. Do you have a comment or? <laughs> uh, you know, um, the, the, the ones that will, those are the preferred ones. I think, so I think this is, this is what I was trying to get at at the end is that we have a, I think that as a, the general science community, we have a real problem with taking the, the software development seriously enough. And um, that we need to have some mechanism where we can identify the, 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 the different pieces of software that should be maintained independent of a particular project because they can support multiple projects. Now, at that same time, we should also identify the software that shouldn't be maintained or may only be maintained by a specific project. Um, What's the phrase from that movie? You know, not everyone gets to be a ballerina, the prima ballerina. Is that's fine. Some some software should live, and some software should not live. Um, but I think what happens is that our funding organizations look at, at least in my experience, they look at things more on a project base or more on a, and and not across multiple projects. I think that's starting to change. I'm really encouraged about that, and I think that this is why I want. This is why I brought up the the RSE organization, because I think if we, can, if we can identify that there are people here who do this, then maybe we can identify we, and we can, you know, fund them in their careers, support them in their careers, then, then we'll have software that can persist across projects. And, but it's a tough sell, um, you know. Okay. Uh, These are hard do, questions. <laughs> but okay. Let's see one here. How another one? How do you balance meetings ending on time with being willing to dive into the weeds? <laughs> yeah. Um, you you it's it's a tough call. I think that it's an, I think that I always I I don't usually let the meetings go over if the meetings are going because you know these days everybody working from home everybody's got another zoom call that happens you know on the hour right so a lot of times they can't go long um a lot of times you just say like you know let's schedule another meeting to go into those details um or maybe the you know the two or three of you can can talk you know or we can we can talk this out um it, it's a constant it's it's a constant balance that you have to do your very best to maintain and just realize there's probably never going to be a fully satisfying solution to that. But um, um, I think though that that feeds into this idea of scheduled releases and just like you have a pace and that whatever you get done within that time slice is what you get done within that time slice. And then you can, you know, move on to the next one. Like maybe if you get into the weeds, it's like, well, how about we just get, you know, this much of the, of the bug fixed or this much of the feature added and then we'll do more later. Uh, just as, a, as an example. Um, Okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's always a tough one. Can you paint more of a picture of code reviews? It sounds like it's asynchronous and the three issues tracker rather than video conferencing, etc. You could do it either way. Um, I think though that um, so GitHub and GitLab, um, they basically have it's basically a back and forth, uh, and it is asynchronous. So people can you know people do a review and they say like you know they mark comments on specific lines of code or just in general, and then somebody responds and it goes back and forth. That works well for some situations, but there may be other situations where it would be better to have like a shared conference, you know, a conference where people get together. I think Zoom and screen sharing is actually very powerful with that because you can have somebody walk, walk through the code. You could even slip it into pair programming. I didn't talk about that, but that's, that's a powerful way of working. Um, uh, it's not like, these, you know, formal, what do they call them? Um, 
Fagan reviews, I think they called them, was, you know, this old school way of like, we're sitting very formal structured code review process. Um, you could start to try to do things more like that, um, depending upon, you know, the culture of your um, team. Um, but I think that you, it's a judgment call that you're just going to have to make in the context as to whether or not this um, asynchronous uh, issue like way of doing a code review for a PR is working for the for the team or for that particular PR. Sometimes you may, I've seen it happen where like a PR, we're just going to close this PR and we're going to create it as like two or three other ones. I mean, that's, that's fine. If, if that's the way that, it, that it, it's in order to break it up to be more manageable. What format do you recommend for developer onboarding? Say tutorial documentation, one-on-one -on -one sessions. What about existing developers that are 15% time and may not remember all of the project processes? Uh, perhaps there is yeah. a need for a refresher in you know, onboarding. Yeah, um, that's good. I mean, we did when we transitioned with Ideas. Um, it was it was basically that addressing of the intellectual property. Um, that motivated us to come up with an onboarding. And what we did is we came up with a set of slides, we did a presentation, and, and then we had a quiz where we actually then made everybody go through and take this quiz and get a perfect 15 out of 15 score. Um, and of course, the writing of the quiz, and we, we had everybody go through it, even people who, existing people who, who had been on the project. Um, now, what we do, this may not be best. If the person asking the question makes a good point in that, um, uh, we basically point new people, say, go to these slides, read them, ask any questions if you want, and then go and pass this quiz. And when you pass the quiz, I'll add you into the team where you can, um, you know, merge PRs or assign issues uh, to people or assign reviewers, give them elevated permissions within GitHub. I think that th it it's, it's probably a good thing where your team may have workshops or, you know, collaboration meetings to maybe have a session for, you know, re-onboarding. That's not a bad idea. Um, the, 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 the scheduled meeting themselves, I find are very educational. So you can have these discussions. You can say like, hey, you know, we should, you, it can be educational for existing people um, on the project. So, um, but, I don't, but I don't think you should necessarily preclude, there could be a chance for like a refresher uh, you know, as things change. That's actually a good idea. So. Keith, on slide 13, um, we got all my transitions, so it takes a while to get back. Right. So do you have recommendations for security testing or recommendations for certifications, certifications to build competence in security, in security testing relevant to scientific software? Uh, I don't. Um, it's it's a huge it's it's a big topic. Um, I'm yeah, I'm open for suggestions. I, I don't have any specific uh, recommendations for security. It's going to be really specific to the software that you're writing, what the different security implications are, right? Um, the, the the you know the security implications for something that is just you know a single installation on some place is gonna be very different than if it's a piece of software that you're sending out to a whole bunch of different people. I would try to um, I would try to leverage as much as possible any of the automated tools. I know that there's, um, I think, is it Coverity? And I think lint, um, there's a lot of linters that will do static analysis on your, on your code looking for common security you know, problems, buffer overflows, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. Um, I, I, I don't have a lot of experience with specific uh, training but, um, or certifications, but I'm sure there's, I'm, I'm sure they can only help. Um, but I would, I would love to hear from people if they have experiences on that as, as to what, what, are good, um, what are good trainings. Um, I mostly put it up here because a lot of times people don't necessarily think about security, which but, uh, for science projects, because the software is usually written or, or usually only run by people that know. Um, but that's not always going to be the case. Hopefully it won't be the case, right? As we get software that becomes usable by a, a wider community of people. So. Uh, Keith, we have, a, it's already 11 here, but if you people, for those who would like to stick a few more, some more minutes with us, we have four questions left here if you'd like to take them. 
and sure, uh, sure. this so so uh this question so the q a will send because there is a question here in the chat we'll be sending the q a to everybody who uh registered for the uh for 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 this webinar okay so don't worry you'll see the the, the answers there okay so at uh ideas <laughs> ideas did you analyze data generated from simulations how did you store all of the the needed data um so yeah this is more of a question for one of the chemies um i think it de it depends on the particular instance we do have a challenge with data because a lot of times the data is proprietary so we have to keep that separated um but that but um i think that's more of, of a specific run of the data um and that's going to be more up to somebody who is using it because for ideas it's it's really a framework that you would install and then you would write custom models that would and, and have property packages data that you would run within there um, so um, it's mostly it's going to be it, i think it's going to be very instance specific as to how that goes so how you would analyze data for a particular um, situation and keith how do you build a culture in your project Slowly, um, that's uh, and in uh, you know, it's a challenge, um, and that I think that that's why I think having the reoccurring meetings is good, and um, and trying to allow people to have communication and give training. Um, I've had experience. I, I don't know. There was there's other experience in other projects where there are people who are very much against the idea of using even like a version control system or even identifying releases. And that I spent a lot of time with this particular person, basically just proving to them that, you know, I'm a nice guy who has some good ideas, right? So like, because I, you know, we didn't have a common boss. So like, all I could do was talk and say like, you know, at times I felt like I was hitting my head up against a wall, um, but basically try to be open and try to be, um, to, try to be inclusive. Um, listen to people, uh, take them seriously, the education. It's, it's, yeah, soft skills. It's, uh, it's, it, it, it takes, it, it takes time. Uh, I don't know if I, I, I don't know if there is any single answer to that, um, other than just, uh, taking time and doing your best, of listening to people and teaching them, demonstrating that these tools can help and that, um, you're working in a collaboration with people. Right. Okay, the final question here, there is actually another one about deep work, but I, I suggest you take a look at this deep work that is a reference and then you answer. So this okay. is what, okay, so how should one who is at this, that's an interesting question, I think. How should one who is at the smallest scale individual and the domain expertise, uh, in other words, not yet a research software engineer, uh, uh, get started on a path towards uh, towards larger efforts. Um, that's a good that's a good question. Um, um, you know, that's just a general career question. Um, uh, reach out to people. Um, try to demonstrate that um, you know you have some abilities and you have some capabilities. Try to get yourself um, added onto larger projects. Um, uh, it depends on your institution. Did I just? Oh no. Okay, you stopped sharing. Um, um, it, it it depends on the environment. How you can reach out to people. I would say trying to involve yourself with di different professional organizations is a good way of doing this. Um, trying to reach out with your coworkers. Say, hey, what are you working on? That sounds interesting. You know. Um, as well as trying to bring up your technical chops as best you can. You know, learn some of these issues. Uh, get involved in, in projects to in whatever extent that you can so. all right so uh thank you very much again keith thank you all for joining sure. us i just take a, a few more seconds here to announce the next webinar in the series september the 15th what i learned from 20 years of leading open source projects uh, by wolfgang bangert from the colorado state you can register for that one already uh, so uh, please give us some feedback about our um, series. 
And these slides uh, are already available there at the event website. Uh, and the recording will be also available there and, and soon available there. Thank you uh, again, all. Um, I'll stop my recording here. And uh, 